you recall as a child there being a consensus that Cromwell was one of Britain's greatest men? A man who brought parliamentary democracy to Britain. A defender of the common people. In 1970, when the film Cromwell came out, we were taken to the cinema to watch it by the school. By then, I was a fervent Republican and devoured the film. However, I do recall watching the atrocities in Ireland and a sense of misgiving these brought with it. My views had been shaped by these early influences. Maybe it's my recent investigation into Shropshire folklore that's causing me to reappraise these deeply held views. Whilst I most certainly have not become a cheerleader for King Charles and Prince Rupert, my misgivings with the parliamentarians are growing. Uh, but I think this is my disillusion with politics in general that is focusing, forcing this reappraisal. The traditional left are appearing increasingly authoritarian, while the right seem to be the supporters of libertarianism. Of course, these are based on US political divisions and its impact on society. Uh, but I guess as a result of social media, such US notions are being adopted in much of the West. Now, it's not my place to expand on my suspicion that this is somehow being manipulated, even flat planned. But it's worth putting this marker down. I guess all that I'm doing is reappraising my views to one that is much less tribal and nuanced. It therefore expresses these more nuanced views in this vlog. <laughs> The English Civil War describes the civil wars between the Royalists and the Parliamentarians in England and Wales from 1642 to 1652. They are part of the wider 1639 to 1653 Wars of the Three Kingdoms, including the First English Civil War, the Second English Civil War and the Third English Civil War, although the Third is really an Anglo-Scottish War, 1650 to 52 as most of the fighting took place in Scotland, whereas the Royalists consisted almost entirely of Scots Coventoners and English exiles. Uh, the First English Civil War was fought primarily over the correct balance of power between Parliament and Charles I. A victory to the Parliamentarians led to concern over the political influence of radicals within the new model army like Oliver Cromwell. Uh, this led to an alliance between moderate parliamentarians and royalists, supported by the Scottish Coventer, Coventers. A royalist defeat in 1648 um, in the Second English Civil War resulted in the execution of Charles I on January, on, on, in January 1649 and the establishment of the Commonwealth of England. In 1650, Charles II was crowned King of Scotland in return for agreeing to create a Presbyterian church in both England and Scotland. Uh, the resulting Anglo-Scottish War ended with parliamentarian victory uh, at Worcester on the 3rd of September 1651. Ireland and Scotland were incorporated into the Commonwealth and Britain became a republic until the Stuart Restoration in 1660. In England, over 100,000 people died from war-related disease during the three civil wars. It's estimated that from 1638 to 1651, 15 to 20% of all adult males in England and Wales served in the military. Around 4% of the population died of war-related causes. The economic, social and political explanations for these wars are complex. Uh, they can broadly be categorised as tensions between a growing urban merchant class augmented by freeholding farmers and almost feudal landlords of the aristocracy. 
In many respects, therefore, the Civil War may be characterised as an unfinished bourgeois revolution. Uh, but this paper's over significant and complex social relations. This was not simply an urban-rural conflict. If anything, it was more a south and east and north and west conflict. Specifically, when Charles I imposed drainage schemes on the Fens in 40, uh, 1642, it disrupted the livelihood of thousands. And many saw the king as indifferent to public welfare, bringing much of eastern England into the parliamentarian camp. Uh, by this time, most Britons, with the exception of Ireland, were no longer Catholics. Often the Anglican Church is classified as Protestant, largely because it does not accept the authority of Rome. Uh, but this is somewhat misleading, particularly in this context. Nevertheless, at this time, around half of Britons were Protestants, and broadly speaking, Puritans. Charles I had been reintroducing more Catholic rituals into the Anglican liturgy, and this was resisted by the Puritans in eastern England and the Calvinist Scots Covenanters. However, such moves were welcomed in the more Catholic and Anglo-Catholic West. In particular, Charles I attempted to impose a new book of common prayer on the Scots Presbyterians, and this resulted in what's known as the Bishop Wars between 1639 and 1640. Charles was forced to negotiate a truce and recall Parliament to fund his losses. But more significant was that this precipitated the Irish Rebellion of 1641. In today's more secular society, it's tempting to dismiss these concerns. Uh, but to the common people at the time, they were deeply personal issues related to their belief in salvation. I would characterise Charles I as something of a benevolent dictator and that he genuinely believed that what he did in terms of law and religion was for the benefit of his nations. I guess the same could be said for all leaders, however repugnant we may find their actions. Certainly had contempt for Parliament and did not respect its authority over a divine monarch. Uh, but his until his execution, there was no other model to influence his views. Indeed, many of the flashpoints were due to him refusing to call and consult with Parliament. Uh, specifically, he used increasingly devious and indeed unjust mechanisms to raise taxes, to avoid consulting with and recalling Parliament. Uh, despite all this, many at the time blamed the king's advisers, especially the Earl of Strafford, rather than the king himself. Having suggested that the South and East were parliamentarian and the North and West were royalist, it's, it's tempting to see Shropshire as staunchly royalist. Uh, but this is an oversimplification. Certainly Wales and Herefordshire were royalists. However, Chester and Cheshire to the north were parliamentarian. This included the Puritan enclave of Wrexham in Wales, while Staffordshire and especially North Staffordshire to the east were also parliamentarian. The position in what is now the West Midlands and Worcestershire was much more complex, with both parliamentarian and royalist garrisons. Uh, this highlights the, the counties and in particular Shrewsbury's strategic position during the Civil War. Politically Shropshire was predominantly royalist at the start of the Civil War. Of the county's 12 members of the Long Parliament called in 1640, eight fought on the royalist side and four for the Parliament. For the parliament. These were Sir John Corbett, the MP for the Shire, Richard Moore for Bishop's Castle, William Pierpoint for Much Wenlock, and William Spurstow for Shrewsbury. Sir John Corbett of Ad Adderley, a former sheriff of the county, was something of a focus for discontent. Even in the 1630s, there were pockets that did not accept the Charles I's views on religion and taxation especially the unjust ship money which unduly affected Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury in particular 
the foundations of the support for Parliament went back some decades amongst the merchants who supported the Puritan cause. For example, William Bright was paid uh, £46 for his services as a preacher. Uh, the wealthy brewer and merchant draper uh, William Rowley of Rowley's House and two former bailiffs, Richard Hunt and John Nichols, were prominent nonconformists. A control of the area was important to the king, as Shropshire was a gateway to the predominantly royalist Wales, as well as to keeping contact with the northwestern counties and western port links with Ireland. Parliamentary control of a Shropshire was achieved with the capture of its last royalist garrison and one of the last garrisons in England, Ludlow Castle, by Parliament in 1646. Uh, Richard Goff, 1635 to 1723 uh, of Middle in Shropshire, wrote somewhere around 1701 about men from his village joining the re uh, royalists. And out of these three towns, Middle, Martin and Newton, there were, there were no less than 20 men, of which number 13 were killed in the wars, and if so, many died of these three towns. We may reasonably guess that many thousands died in that war. after raising his standard at Nottingham, Charles I proceeded into Shropshire, arriving via Newport on the 19th of September 1642. On the 20th of September he issued the Wellington Declaration in Wellington Market Square. This promised to preserve the Protestant religion, laws and liberties of his subjects and the privileges of parliaments in then inspecting his troops below the Reekin. From Wellington he marched to Shrewsbury, where he was joined by his two sons, the Prince of Wales and James, Duke of York, and his nephew, Prince Rupert, and a great number of noblemen and gentlemen. It was then that the Shrewsbury Mint was established. The town's medieval walls, gateways and castle were repaired. Work continued until 1644 to maintain the defences and strengthen them with earthworks. Under Prince Rupert's direction, town folks were compelled to join in the work themselves, or else pay for labourers. Prince Rupert certainly stayed in the manor house that is now known as the Prince Rupert Hotel. Indeed, in... Um, 1638, Charles I granted Shrewsbury its first mayor, Thomas Jones, a leading draper, who owned this manor house. Uh, by all accounts, the dashing cavalier Prince Rupert was well liked by the townspeople of Shrewsbury, especially the women. Uh, this relationship soured when he raised taxes and looted the town and countryside. Charles I remained in Shrewsbury until the 12th of October. He then marched to Bridge North and from there he advanced to Edge Hill in Warwickshire, the scene of the first pitch battle of the First, first Civil War. In January 1643, Charles I formally appointed Sir Francis Otley as Governor of Shrewsbury. The parliamentarians, including Shropshire Gentry, formed the Committee of Association for Warwickshire, Staffordshire and Shropshire in April 1643. At this stage, the parliamentary enclave in Shropshire stretched from the Staffordshire border to Loppington, just past Wem. In August, uh, the parliament Parliamentary garrison, the Parliament garrisoned when it, threat, it was threatened by royalist forces under Lord Capel, who were forced to retreat by the Parliamentary army arriving from Chester, which was a Parliamentary stronghold. Uh, the women of Wem and a few musketeers beat Lord Capel and all his cavaliers, is a local saying. Early in 1643, King Charles I appointed three noblemen as regional lieutenant governors to govern and direct military operations in Wales and the Marshes. 
Uh, the six counties of North Wales, Flint, Denby, Carnarvon, Merionmouth, Montgomery and Anglesey, were allotted to Lord Capel, who was also responsible for the northern marsh counties of Cheshire, Shropshire and Worcestershire. Keppel set up his headquarters at Shrewsbury in March 1643. On the 12th of December 1643, Tong Castle was captured by parliamentary forces from Eccleshaw, Staffordshire. Uh, by this time, the master of Shrewsbury School commented that the completion of the, on the completion of the annual audit was marked by a dinner instead of a customary banquet, reflecting the amp imp financial impact of the war on the town. On the 13th of March 1644, Hopton Hall was recaptured by the Royalists. The parliamentary commander, Colonel Moore, did not surrender until after the final assault. The Royalist commander, Sir Michael Woodhouse, at his digression, uh, decided not to grant clemency to the majority of his prisoners and they were killed by their captors, throwing them into a muddy pit. Something that is still remembered today and a great bone of contention during the Civil War in Shropshire. On the 25th of March, the Battle of Longford with Colonel T Thomas Mitten, an ancestor of Mad Jack, no less, commanding 500 parliamentarians headed for the Royalist strongholds of Lillishall Abbey and Lee Castle. He paused at Longford near Newport, which was garrisoned by parliamentarians to rest his men. There, however, Sir William Vaughan and Colonel Robert Ellis, led by local Royalist forces to find Mitten and rout him. The Royalists then besieged the small garrison, which took shelter in Longford Hall, which held out for a week before surrendered to the Royalists on the 2nd of, August, uh, 2nd of April. 1644. On the 6th of April, uh, Tom Castle was captured by the Royalists under the command of Prince Rupert. In the June, the King was in Shrewsbury during the campaign and led the, uh, that led the Battle of uh, Copredi Bridge. At this time, Wem was the only, uh, only Wem remained a parliamentarian stronghold. In February 1644, Prince Rupert moved to Wales to take up his new post as President of Wales. In May of the year, however, he marched his available forces to Lancashire, leaving Oswestry garrisoned by a small force under the command of Colonel Edward Lloyd. At the time, the Royalists of the Oswestry garrison were responsible for the control of Wales and the marshes. With the absence of Prince Rupert, the local parliamentarians, led by Lord Denby and his cousin, Colonel Thomas Mitten, decided in June 1664 to take control of the walled town and castle. In July, Oswestry was besieged by the Royalists under Colonel Marrow, uh, but it was relieved by Sir Thomas Middleton, who took Lord Newport's eldest son, Francis, and 200 men prisoner. Uh, this ceded most of North Shropshire to the parliamentary forces. Uh, by August, Prince Rupert had Sir Francis Otley replaced as Royal Governor of Shrewsbury by Sir Falk Huckness, but was later replaced by Sir Michael Earnley due to Sir Falk Huckness' unpopularity. A part of this unpopularity was due to an abortive attempt to retake Oswestry and the subsequent demolition of Oswestry Castle. In early October, Sir, Sir William Vaughan, the Royalist Governor of Shorewardine Castle, was captured by Major General Thomas Mitten. He was allowed back into the castle on the pretext of negotiating the garrison surrender, but tricked Mitten by raising a drawbridge and broke his parole. By the winter, Vaughan was appointed General of Shropshire and quartered his regiment around the county, uh, leaving his parson brother James in charge of Sherwoodine. In February 1645, Apley House was taken by the parliamentarians under Sir John Price when Sir William and Sir Thomas Whitmore, Sir Francis Otley and about 60 men were made prisoners. On the 23rd of February, Parliament uh, captured Shrewsbury Town, 
by surprise and the castle surrendered the following day. The governor, Sir Michael Early, was wounded in the attack and died in April of either that or, or his wounds, uh, uh, died of his wounds. Um, at the surrender, Thomas Mitten, the parliamentary governor of Wem, in command of the parliamentary forces, took 16 pieces of ordnance, about 60 gentlemen and 200 soldiers. A local legend holds that Colonel John Bembo, uncle of Sir Admiral Bembo of Newport, led the attack from the Traitor's Gate on the River Severn. Uh, this is, however, contested. What is true is that Bembo was executed on the castle approach, along with Irish Catholic mercenaries garrisoned at the castle, although not on the same occasion. In the same month, they also captured Bethnal Hall from the late uh, Royalists. Colonel Lawrence Bethnal had fortified his Bethnal Hall for the king. In March 1643, he commanded the garrison in a successful attack on a parliamentary plundering party led by Colonel Mitten of Wem. On the 12th of June, there was a battle at Stokesay near Ludlow. Fortunately, the Royalists surrendered, and this is probably the reason why Stokesay Castle remains so intact today. The Royalists were defeated, and Sir William Croft was slain by the Parliamentarians. Stokesay Castle was captured, and Cowes Castle and Sheridan also fell to Parliament that same month. Uh, by this time, only High Arkel, Bridge North, and remained in the hands of the Royalists. Uh, but on the 4th and 5th of July, Sir William Vaughan won two significant victories, resulting uh, in relief of the besieged garrison of High Arkle. In the late autumn, Oliver Cromwell appeared before Longford. The village was quickly taken and the general immediately placed Longford Hall under siege. Under Cromwell's call for the garrison to surrender, uh, Sir, Sir Bolifolomew Pell, the royalist commander, entered into negotiations with Cromwell when in favourable terms, under the surrender, the garrison surrendered their arm. Clubmen were a local association of war-weary men who took up arms and banded together in an attempt to resist, both royalist and parliamentarians, and to keep the war out of their regions. Clubmen uprisings tended to occur in areas that had suffered badly from plundering, free quartering of troops and other depredations of war. Clubman first appeared in Wem in December 1644 when 1,200 men assembled to protest against plundering by Royalist garrison at Stokesay Castle and Lee Hall. The clubmen were led by a parson of Bishop's Castle and local minor gentry. The movement spread throughout the country, counties on the Welsh border during the winter of 1644-5. On the 28th of March 1646, the Royalist garrison of High Arkle, under Sir Vincent Corbett, capitulated. In April, after a month-month siege, the Royalist garrison of Bridge North Council surrendered to the Parliamentarians. And on the 9th of July, the Royalist garrison of Ludlow surrendered to Sir William Brereton. Sir William Brereton was a parliamentary commander of Cheshire, Shropshire, Lancashire and Staffordshire uh, to threaten the Royalists on the Northern Marshes. In 1647, due to the fear of Royalist uprisings, led to Parliament, or, led to Parliament ordered Shrewsbury regarrisoned. Indeed, in 1654, Sir Thomas Harries led an abortive Royalist uprising to capture Shrewsbury Castle in a surprise attack. On the 4th of September 1651, Charles II and the Earl of Charles I and the Earl of Derby arrived at White Lady's Priory, fleeing from the defeat of the Battle of Worcester. Charles had his hair cut off and he disguised himself. He fled to Boscobel House, just, just inside Shropshire, where he was concealed during the night and in the daytime he hid himself with Colonel Curless in the Royal Oak. Overnight of the 5th and 6th of September, he took a night ride to Maidley Court, where he hid at the barn, but was advised by the court's owner, Francis Wolfe, not to cross the River Severn for Wales. From Boscobel, he went to Mr Whitegrave's house at Moseley in Staffordshire on the 8th of September. 
despite the Shrewsbury Woolwich and Speared supporters of the parliamentary cause. The Civil War led to an end of monopoly on the Welsh wool trade. In particular, the restoration of Charles II in 1660, the drapers suffered the consequences. In the 18th century, as the turnpike system revolutionised transport and as Welsh capitalism developed, the importance of the Shrewsbury merchants declined and by the 1790s the trade was dead. These developments coincided with the industrialisation, particularly of the Colbrookdale Gorge. Deposits of coal, clay, tar and iron, often close to the surface across Shropshire, made it briefly the leading industrial county. Even Shrewsbury took on a much more industrial rather than mercantile nature. Uh, but maybe the impact was even more subtle in exposing the chasm between the more mystical beliefs of the marshes compared to the rest of England. As I previously argued, Shrewsbury really did not partake in the witch hunt of Eastern England, even during the turmoil of the Civil War. Uh, but the rejection of mysticism was a gradual process, which continues even with some revival in places like Bishop's Castle. Thank you.